Hello and welcome to this clip looking at the second question from the 2016 Cambridge Chemistry Challenge paper. This is the second clip in my series uh, because I want to look at uh, the organic style questions. The, pre the previous clip that I did looked at um, inorganic style questions which tend to have gone up on question number one. So the second question in the paper is normally covers uh, more challenging and deductive organic chemistry that you may not have come across before, or at least it might appear that you haven't come across it before. So like I've said in previous clips, the examiners will always put a box in front of you in the, um, in the, the top sheet, which tries to encourage you to think logically, because it's designed to actually push you beyond your comfort zone. So although initially the questions might appear difficult, you can think through them logically if you keep calm and think about the clues that they give you. So it's worth pointing out one more time that uh, Cambridge Chemistry Challenge papers in particular compared to other A-levels will test how comfortable you are converting between units and differing, differing orders of magnitude during calculations. So in other words, expect very big and very small numbers on your calculator display and don't be put off by this. Right then, let's get started. So in terms of resources that you're given, within the question pack you'll have um, a periodic table which might actually be a bit different to the one used by your exam board. So it's important to remember to actually use the data from the periodic table that's provided during the, the exam, not for example just remembering some um, common relative atomic mass values you may now be able to recall from the periodic table you normally use. So to give it context, the organic question in a C3L6 paper will generally be about something that's been in the news that particular year. So during this particular year, there is an epidemic of the mosquito-borne Zika virus across Central and South America. So this virus in general only produces mild flu-like symptoms in adults, but if it bites, if it, um, sorry, if a mosquito bites a pregnant mother, and the virus infects her and reaches her unborn child, you can get um, some quite unpleasant effects such as microcephaly, um, which is basically an abnormally small skull, um, which obviously leads to lots of different problems for that child and can also affect their life expectancy. So this question is about a family of insecticides called pyrethrins, um, uh, which are basically used or have been used to combat and prevent the, um, the spread of Zika by, uh, by killing the mosquitoes that are responsible. So if we have a quick look through the first couple of sections, it gives you a molecule you haven't seen before, but I'm sure you'll be able to notice some of the common functional groups. So you can clearly see two double bonds on the end. And paying a bit of attention to the uh, skeletal formula, you can see that both appear to be of the E isomer. So moving along the molecule, you've got a five-membered ring with a ketone group and a carbon-carbon double bond. So moving along, right to left, you've got a three-carbon saturated ring with two methyl branches. And coming off this ring, there's an alkyl branch circled in blue with another carbon-carbon double bond. So for the molecular formula, all you have to do is carefully count up the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. So although it's accessible like we said a little while back, it does require a careful approach and a good understanding of skeletal formulae. So moving on to part B, it says assuming that only the carbon-carbon double bonds react, you might notice that we did a little look at the molecule earlier and there were quite a few carbon-carbon double bonds. Um, how many moles of Br2 will react with a 500 milligram sample of pyrethrin 1. So the first thing to do is to convert your milligrams into a mass that you can work with in terms of moles. So it's a simple case of doing mass over MR now to work out the number of moles of pyrethrin 1. So once you've done that you can work out how many times bromine will react with pyrethrin 1. So applying the logic that for every carbon-carbon double bond you'll have one mole of bromine, sorry, one individual bromine molecule reacting with it. So there's a one-to-one -one mole ratio between Br2 and CC double bond. So that'll mean you've got 6.292 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of bromine. 
which would be 6.09 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, to three significant figures. In this next part, what they want you to do is determine the volume of 0 0.05 mole to the to minus 3 bromine water that would react with a 500 milligram sample per erythrin 1. And it asks you to give your answer in centimetres cubed. So you start by doing V equals N over C. So if we put, plug in the numbers that we've already worked out, number of moles, keeping the calculator value, uh, divided by 0 0.05 gives you 0 0.122 uh, or 122 to three significant figures. So this next part now becomes a bit more challenging. Not just because it introduces another member of the pyrethrin family, cypermethrin, but you're asked to analyse a calibration graph for the concentration of this insecticide in blueberries which we eat. So it should be fairly obvious that there's an importance here uh, because obviously we don't want uh, insecticides to end up in our food chain. So we obviously eat blueberries and if blueberries are prone to having this insecticide sprayed on them then it's going to be a potential problem if let's say toddlers or small children were to eat these blueberries. So that's going to be the emphasis of this particular part of the question. So it now starts talking about the amount of cypromethrin that can be consumed without um, risk of harm. So this is called the MRL, or a minimum risk level. So it's about 0 0.02 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. So they took four blueberries, assuming four, four blueberries is about the size of a small handful that you might pop into your mouth if you're having a snack from blueberries. And they ground them into a sample that had a volume of about 15 centimetres cubed, and the peak area was observed to be 4.8. So they want the concentration of cypromethrin in the sample. So the first thing I suggest doing is converting the volume of your ground blueberry sample into decimeters cubed. Because the concentration of the cypromethrin is given in um, micromoles per decimeter to the minus 3. So we need to work out the um, conversion from peak area to concentration and we've got that up at the top of the page. So we know the peak area is 4.8 so if I insert the numbers in so that gives us 0 0.0538 micromoles per decimeter to the minus 3. So to calculate the mass of uh, your cypromethrin in the sample, you've got to convert micromoles to moles. So it's a multiplication factor of times 10 to the minus 6 to convert from micromoles into moles. And you multiply that times your 0 0.015 decimeters cubed because uh, you have to do it in terms of moles per decimeter to the minus 3, which is your concentration, not moles per centimeter to the minus 3, which is your sample. So that gives us uh, 3.36 times 10 to the minus 7 grams. And the next part asks how many blue blueberries can a 15 kilogram toddler consume per day without exceeding the MRL. So just reminding ourselves what the minimum risk level is. Because we're dealing in milligrams, we need to do a bit of conversion to our mass, which is in grams. So that gives us 2 times 10 to the minus 5 grams per kilogram per day which in turn gives us 30 times 10 to the minus 5 grams per day for a 15 kilogram toddler. So doing the conversion for, in fact there's four blueberries in the sample that we got the mass for, there must be 0 0.84 times 10 to the minus 7 grams of cypromethrin in one blueberry, which in turn gives us 3,571 whole blueberries. So part C was quite hard in terms of keeping on top of the units, the uh, orders of magnitude and all the rest of it. So it's the, the next part is a little bit easier. It's a mass spectrum part. Um, but you have to still be having your, your, your brain in good working order here because it's still a Cambridge Chemistry Challenge paper. So it now switches to talking about the fact that there's halogens inside many of the molecules of pyrethrins. 
So, for example, the two chlorine atoms found in cypermethrin. So in part D, what they're asking you is to put down all the different ways in which the two isotope, isotopes of bromine, which have equal abundance, could actually combine with each other. And the final one's included because of the order in which uh, the two bromine atoms combine. So in a mass spectrometer, the next part of the question says, which of the four mass spectra would you expect to match that of Br2? So in a mass spectrometer, you're going to get those five different combinations. There's a little bit of probability you've got to apply here. The combination of two atoms of the same isotope is half as likely as one with two, uh, uh, one, with one of each. By the same token, because of the nature of mass spectroscopy and the fragmentations that you know of, um, it's likely that covalent bonds are broken. So it's quite possible that you'll get um, the bromine-bromine bond being broken. It's actually more likely that that will happen. So you can see the combinations that are um, more probable than the others, um, as labelled in the table. So now let's look at each of the spectra in turn. So with spectrum A, the fragment at mz equals 160 is four times more abundant than the, one, uh, the ones at 158 and at 162, so it's not that one. So spectrum B is no good either because if you look at the same three fragments, they appear to have the same abundance. So in spectrum C, um, the fragment m over z158 is missing in the first place, so it's not that one either. In this one, um, all fragments are in the correct ratios of abundance which match their probabilities. So spectrum D is the correct answer. So in this next question, you're asked to consider what an equivalent spectrum for chlorine might look like, bearing in mind that the ratio of 37 chlorine to 35 chlorine um, is 25% to 75% abundance. So if you were to think about the equivalent um, fragments that chlorine would form, not forgetting of course they'd all be um, positively charged um, in the mass spectrometer, it says what mz values will the peaks corresponding to Cl2 in the mass spectrum have? So Cl2 is just the ones that are now in blue. So your answers would be mz equals 70, mz equals 72 and mz equals 74. So the next part of the question is asking you, what will the relative intensities of the peaks corresponding to Cl2 in a mass spectrum be? You've got to remember here that 35 chlorine is three times as abundant as 37 chlorine. So turning that into probabilities, the probability of 35 Cl will be 3, and the probability of 37 Cl will be 1. So if you do the equivalent maths by multiplying the probabilities together, you get a ratio of 9 to 6 to 1, as labelled on the table. So in part G, what they want you to do is apply this idea mathematically to three different pyrethrins. So you want the, all of the molecular ions and their corresponding relative intensities. So earlier on in the section, we also worked with bromine as well as uh, Cl. So starting with cypermethrin that has two chlorines, it will follow the 96 to 1 that we just worked out in part F. So the 415, 417, 419 are the molecular masses of uh, cypermethrin taking into account the different isotopes. So if you do maths, you'll start to see that um, it's really Pascal's triangle in action, isn't it, for trilomethrin? Because there's twice as many bromines present, so the probabilities have to be adjusted accordingly. So looking at part H, we're moving back to calculations and dealing with units and orders of magnitude this time. So the recommended concentration of delta methrin on a mosquito net is 55 milligrams per meter squared. So starting with working out how many milligrams of delta methrin you'll need overall, it's 12.5 meters squared for the area of a mosquito net, and it's 55 milligrams is needed uh, as the recommended concentration. So if you're using a 10% solution, that means 10 grams per 100 centimetres to the minus 3. 
sorry I wrote that out wrong, 10 grams per 100 centimeters cubed. So that means 0 0.1 grams per centimeter cubed, which means 100 milligrams per centimeter cubed. So that would mean you'd have 6.875 centimeters cubed required. So let's now switch to organic chemistry. So basically what you've got to do here is to apply the, um, the, the equation that they've put in bold uh, to the three structures that they provided you. So just to, to explain what a, a carbonyl group is, it's part of a larger molecule um, where it's C double bond O. So you take the equation in blue and you apply it to the substances that are listed in I, I, I and I, I, I. So let's look at the first one. Quite straightforward example, not too hard. The idea is that you break up the ester into a carboxylic acid and a alcohol. So that's called hydrolysis, func uh, focusing on the functional group changes only. In the second one, you've got a cyclic ester. So what that means is the ester uh, group will break open like it did before, but the resulting COOH and OH groups will be on the same molecule. So you'll get something uh, like what's about to come up um, with an OH and then a COOH, but notice that the carbon chain still remains intact. This one might look a bit more difficult to start off with. It's actually one part of it that's going to, to react. The ester group, as is now highlighted in green. So hopefully you've been able to follow how you'd end up with those two um, substances. In other words, a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So the next part of the question deals with an antimalarial uh, or a set of antimalarial drugs based around this structure called quinoline. So these two reagents, reagent U and reagent V, are used to make primaquine, uh, which is, uh, you can see from the structure, is similar to quinoline. So, it gives you some information. The NH2 group in reagent U is a good nucleophile, and reagent V is a good electrophile. And it also says that all the carbon atoms are used from U and V, so this suggests no carbon-containing side products. So if, you, if it's a nucleophile, and the amine group is a nucleophilic group, it means it's got a lone pair on the nitrogen atom which can take part in data covalent bonding. Reagent V is able to accept electron pairs as in its role as an electrophile, so you need to have a familiarity between what an electrophile is and what a nucleophile is. So we know that U is a nucleophile, we know that the nitrogen atom has a lone pair that enables this to happen, V is an electrophile and will therefore be good at accepting electron pairs. So, it says you start from one molecule of reagent V and react it with U using only the nitrogen in the NH2 group. You can end up with four different possible molecules. Two are structural isomers and two others of different molecular formulae. So the two structural isomers are created by eliminating HBr so that one of the Br atoms is substituted by the whole uh, molecule of um, reagent U. The third possibility, which is quite tricky to work out, is that both of the bromine atoms are substituted. So what happens is the remaining alicyclic, sorry, the remaining alkyl chain forms an alicyclic ring centered around the nitrogen atom, which you can now see highlighted. And this actually uh, creates two HBr molecules that come off as side products. And the final possibility is that one molecule of V combines with two molecules of U, again losing your two bromines as 2HBr. So in the next question, what they want us to do is to decide between our four products that we came up with in the previous question and which one is the most likely to be useful for making, making primaquine. So just quickly reminding ourselves uh, what the, the primaquine structure is. shouldn't be too difficult to work out which one it is. 
So hopefully you can see quite clearly that it's uh, that first one. Okay, then it asks you to suggest the reagent you would treat this product with to give primaquine. So you should be able to work out that Br must be substituted with NH2. So we can use ammonia as a nucleophile to achieve this reaction. So this next part requires you to make use of some of the clues they give you, such as uh, spectral data, for example, or perhaps even empirical formula data. So expect to have to use these um, in the next part of the question. So let's start with anion W. This must be formed from the reaction of the starting product containing nitrogen with KOH. So I'm thinking on my feet here. I, I haven't come across this reaction before, but I'm thinking I've got to create something that's negatively charged. What could OH- react with? It could remove a proton from somewhere because it's a strong alkali. So it could remove an H from nitrogen to create anion W. So let's put down a structure for anion W. So looking at the starting reagents, reagent V will react with this compound or this anion. So in the case of compound Z, it's quite straightforward. You join, uh, sorry, you combine anion W with um, your original reagent V. And if you look at the relative intensity uh, of the two MZs, one is 295 and one is 297, they are two apart, just like the two MZs for um, the isotopes of bromine, bromine 81, bromine, 80, uh, bromine 79. So the two uh, peaks in the mass spectra is compound Z, one molecule with 79 bromine and one molecule with 81 bromine. So to work out the structure of compound Y it's quite, stra quite straightforward. You just take the compound circled in green and add that together to compound X that you've just worked out. So you get a structure that looks like that, so that's your compound Y. So let's uh, leave that compound there and uh, use the data, the percentage by mass data, to work out the empirical formula of byproduct Z, because that's what's going to help us put together a possible structure. So if we divide the relative atomic mass by, sorry, the percentage by the relative atomic mass at first, that will give us a rough um, ratio. We now divide this through by the smallest to give us uh, 4, 3, 1, and 1, which is C483 NO. Now there's a slight problem with this. If you look in the reaction scheme, going from compound Y to primaquine, another reagent was used, H2N NH2. And most of the uh, fancy part of the structure is retained in primaquine. So this is an, an alternative compound that is formed uh, with the reaction uh, of H2N NH2. So byproduct Z should contain more than one nitrogen atom. So therefore what we do to get around that problem is we multiply everything up to make sure there's more than one nitrogen atom. So if we treat C4H3NO as the empirical formula and multiply it by 2, that gives us C8H6N2O2. So let's now have a think about where this would come from. So one nitrogen in N2H4, at least one, must have reacted or be nucleophilic. Therefore, let's think about what else that um, N2H2 could have reacted with. N2H4, I meant to say, sorry. So, if we get rid of the data, to clear the page a little bit, and just consider before we do that, that one or more of the nitrogen atoms in the um, N2H4 hydrazine will react with the starting material, this could be the only way to create our compound C8H6N2O2 because that starting material contains eight carbons. So let's think about what you might make if that starting material reacted with H2N and H2. So there are two possibilities that you could get. 
uh, you can either get a full reaction where the hydrazine molecule becomes integrated into the compound, or a partial reaction where only one of the nitrogens becomes integrated into the compound. Either way, you end up with the same uh, molecular formula. So hopefully this clip, although parts of it were quite hard, gives you an idea of how you could think your way through some of the more applied organic questions you might like to see, or are likely to see. So in the meantime, thanks again for listening, and until next time, see you soon.